Kumar, and my colleagues Dr. Umakant, Dr. Emmanuel Kumar, Dr. K.G. Manjunath. And today we have a webinar which is organized by the Department of Sericulture, University of Mysore, Manasangotri Mysore. This is the seventh webinar we are organizing. Today we have guest speaker with us, uh, Dr. P.P. P. Nageshwar Rao. Dr. P.P. P. Nageshwar Rao is going to deliver a lecture on applications of geoinformatics in sericulture development. First of all, I would like to introduce the guest speaker to the participants. Pinna Memi Peda Nageshwar Rao hails from Guntur district of Andhra Pradesh. He, has, he got his B.Sc. degree from Andhra University, M.Sc., M.Phil and Ph.D. from Vikram University, Ujjain. Dr. Rao joined the profession of remote sensing in early 1978 at National Remote Sensing Agency, Hyderabad. Now it is presently called as ISRO's NRSC. During a short period from September to 1980 to February 1982, he served as a research officer at Indian Institute of Technology, Karakpur. Dr. Rao joined the Indian Space Research Organization at its headquarters in Bangalore in February 1982. And Dr. served in various capacities and contributed significantly towards establishment of National Natural Resources Management System, shortly called as NNRMS. Dr. Rao served as member secretary of high level committees of NN, uh, NNRMS in the sectors related to agriculture and water resources. As a member of many expert groups or committees, he has paved the way for institutionalization of space technology based services in these sectors. Dr. Rao served five years as head of the Southern Regional Remote Sensing Service Center, that is shortly called as RRSSC of ISRO during 1998 to 2003. Dr. Rao served as the project director for many projects of ISRO, namely, Integrated Mission for Sustainable Development, Agroclimatic pla agro Planning and Information Bank, Project Geoforms of a nationwide giant project between IFCO and ISRO, and Project SILS, that's most important, Sericulture in Information Linkage and Knowledge System developed for Central Silk Board, that is Ministry of Textiles, Government of India. Dr. Rao joined the Northeastern Space Application Center, NASAC, Shillong in July 2003, and as director of that center, he developed NASAC into a center of excellence in the applications of space science and technology in addressing the developmental needs of northeastern region of our country. Dr. Rao was program director of ISRO Geosphere Biosphere Program, shortly called as IGBP, during June 2011 to February 2013. Dr. Rao retired from ISRO as an outstanding scientist on 28 February 2013. Since March 2013, he is serving as consultant, Karnataka State Remote Sensing Application Center, KSRSAC, as well as a faculty member, Vishweshwaraya Technological University Extension Center, run by KS, KSRASC, teaching the students of MTech Geoinformatics. He is a chairman, technical expert committee, Planning Department, Government of Karnataka, advising them on involvements, improvements needed for generating accurate and timely estimates of crop production. Dr. Rao is also Chairman Expert Committee to study the market potential for geospatial technologies constituted by Government of Karnataka. Dr. Rao has widely traveled serving as a resource person for the United Nations, shortly called as UN, Food and Agricultural Organization and UN Economic Social Commission for the Asia Pacific. Dr. Rao has more than 70 publications in peer reviewed, that is, national and international journals, and contributed chapters in a few books. He guided many MTech students and five PhD students. Dr. Rao is a member of the Indian Society of Remote Sensing, Indian Society of Geometrics, Indian National Cartographic Association, and Astronautical Society of India. More importantly, he has been honored thrice with ISRO's Team Excellence Award in the year 2006, 2007, and 2008 consecutively. He has been conferred ISRO Merit Award for the year 2008. He received the prestigious Satish Dhawan Award for the year 2009 from Indian Society of Remote Sensing. 
More importantly, Dr. Rao has a lot of affinity to sericulture. Because since 1980, sir has been working on utilization of space technology in sericulture development. Sir, first research paper on the use of space technology was published in Indian Silk in 1996. Dr. Rao has implemented rupees a 275 lakh project in collaboration with Central Silk Board, Government of India. So with this uh, brief introduction about the Dr. P.P. P. Rao, P. P. and Rao, I request uh, to take over the dais for, uh, to deliver a lecture on applications of geoinformatics in say, the development of sericulture. Please, sir. Please, over to P.P. P. and Rao, sir. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much yeah, please, for introducing me. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. I hope the slides are visible. Yes, yes. Sir. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Chairman of the Department of Sericulture, Professor Sanapa, his colleagues from the Department of Sericulture, Mysore University, and nearly some 100 participants of this uh, uh, distinguished uh, webinar being organized by the University of Mysore. I deem it a privilege and an honor that uh, the uh, beloved Professor uh, Sanapa has considered me appropriate to address this gathering of uh, uh, those who are interested in developing sericulture. Uh, the topic given, as you all, uh, all have heard from him, applications of geoinformatics in sericulture development. And uh, this slide, my purpose of this, intention of this slide is to show this email for all those 100 and 100 uh, participants that this email, let me highlight with a pointer, this email, please note down. And in uh, future, you can be in touch with me on this email. My email is very simple, ppn1953, drambrown at gmail.com. So when we talk of sericulture development, we should also know what are those, what are those, uh, you know, developmental needs. And not that you do not know what is sericulture. The art and science of silk production is called sericulture. It comprises, uh, you know, cultivation of food plants, silkworm rearing, host cocoon activities, ultimately lead, leading to production of fine silk yarn. Sericulture provides, as you all know, gainful employment to several farmers, economic development, and improvement in the quality of life of the rural people in India. It plays a very important role in anti poverty programs and prevents migration of people from rural to urban areas. Several nations, I put them in, in the alphabetical order, Brazil, China, India, Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, several countries uh, take up this sericulture as a, a profession sometimes, sericulture as a livelihood activities, and, and to provide employment to the people in rural areas. That is what is the core of sericulture, a brief introduction to sericulture. Now, what is geoinformatics? Most of you may be wondering, what is this subject called geoinformatics? Geoinformatics, it is a, a technology and a, a sort of tool for handling spatial data and spatial information for collecting, storing, processing, creating databases and image processing included in it, ultimately for decision-making and, this, and you know, when a, web enabling the spatial database can be disseminated to, to those who are unreached and re, reached and reached. Uh, and such an integration of technologies is called geospatial or geoinformatics. The technologies used in geoinformatics, geo refers to art and you know information related to processing, collection, processing, and dissemination of valuable information about art is geoinformatics. That way, you can take that also as a broad definition. 
the commonly used technologies uh, in geoinformatics are remote sensing for data collection, as I mentioned here, image processing and analysis for convert, converting raw data into valuable information, the global navigational satellite systems, also called the American word called GPS, for geocoding and spatial referencing, in other words, for location information, GNSS for location information on location, collecting data on location of objects on surface of Earth, or phenomenon on Earth, and geographical information systems, GIS, for analysis and generating planning tools and spatial data analytics, and information communication technologies for information dissemination. These are the supporting technologies which are important components of geoinformatics. Let me, let me also give you a brief on each of those items which I have discussed in the previous slide. Remote sensing is a sensing from distance. In the shortest form, the word remote sensing is sensing from a distance. We use our eyes, we use our ears, uh, you know, for uh, sensing from a distance. Also, nose. We also use nose for sensing from a distance. Let me put it that way. Of course, skin is used for sensing with the touch. So, sensing from a distance is remote sensing. It's a means of deriving information about an object or a phenomenon from measurements made from a distance, at a distance from the object or a phenomenon. This is normally done by detecting the radiance, radiance, you know, either reflected or emitted radiance, reflected or emitted radiance coming from objects which are receiving the incident radiation from the sun. And this reflected radiant, reflected or emitted radiance, which is collected at this sensor, is sent to the ground station. Such a ground station is available for India in uh, uh, Shadnagar near Hyderabad uh, under the uh, under the administrative control of uh, International Remote Sensing Center of ISRO. And from there, the uh, data processing center at NRSA processes it and disseminates that uh, raw data uh, to various users who in turn interpret and uh, analyze and make information out of raw data. Satellite remote sensing is one such remote, list, remote sensing device. Satellite remote sensing, here I have given you an example of Resource Sat 2 as a uh, you know very important satellite uh, that was launched in two, uh, 2011, some nine years ago, and it has several sensors: linear imaging, self-scanning sensor, list three, list four, and uh, advanced wide field sensor. The photographs of these are shown here. I'm not going into the details of the uh, technical specifications of these uh, sens sensors and satellite, though they are given here. But I will more emphasize how this uh, data is used in, I know, development of sericulture. Uh, you know, an image, an image collected from such a remotely satellite platforms, satellite remote sensing is shown here about Kabbanala village in Kanakapura Taluk of Ramanagar district. Now you can see these, uh, you know, a water body, several uh, croplands. In this, majority of these croplands are, uh, these red colored areas are Malabri Gardens. There is a water body here, there is a reservoir here, there is a river, and uh, you know, uh, some of the villages, Kebahalli village is shown, the road network, the footpath, and the horticulture gardens, horticulture gardens, mulberry gardens are all in bright red color here. And you know, co coconut, etc., could be seen here so nicely. Farm fields can be seen, farm buns can be seen. That is the spatial resolution available today. There is much more special, you know, better spatial resolution than what I have right now shown you. We'll discuss that in the subsequent slides when I'm coming to the uh, development of sericulture. Another tool today available for uh, uh, remotely sensing or sensing the objects and, and properties from a distance uh, is the unmanned aerial vehicles, also called drones. Unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles have revolutionized the technology of sensing from a distance. Today, we talk of spatial resolutions of one millimeter and, and a few centimeters is the spatial resolution coming from some of the sensors like 
I know 20 megapixel Sony 8, 8, the A6000 camera, uh, and uh, along with the flight planning comes, software comes, and it has got a 20 minutes, uh, you know, endurance, and at a range of two kilometers it can go. Even it provides 3D models, and very powerful cameras are available today from uh, drones. The third technology that has revolutionized our uh, uh, location information collection is the Global Navigational Satellite System, GNSS for short. And today, uh, you know the word, very commonly used word, Global Positioning System, GPS, is an American word, coined word. U US has coined this word, Global Positioning System. Several such GNSS, Global Navigational Satellite Systems, Russia has called it as GLONASS, Europe has called it a Galileo, China has called it Bidu, whereas India has called such a uh, you know, a navigation system as NAVIC. Our beloved Prime Minister called this, uh, uh, our uh, GNSS, our original navigational satellite system as NAVIC. NAVIC stands for Navigation with Indian Constellation of Satellite. It has seven satellites in space, and uh, you know, it can provide 7.6 meters uncorrected raw, you know, uh, uh, sp spatial uh, resolution of 7.6, in other words, if you are locating a point, you can be within uh, plus or minus 7.6 if you are using a, a single receiver like what you are seeing here. But in a diff differential GPS mode, this can be much more improved to limit centimeters and uh, less than a meter uh, accuracy. And it covers India, whole of India and 1,400 kilometers around us. And the GNSS of uh, US called GPS has got uh, you know 24 satellites orbiting in six uh, orbits like this. Each orbit has having six satellites in each, and that forms the space segment of the GPS of USA. Where this is the space segment, whereas the grounds uh, rather user segment uh, consists of several billions of GPS receivers, uh, which are uh, being used by uh, several people. I know everybody, you know, auto rickshaws, uh, you know, Ola cabs, Uber cabs, and any navigation and positioning uh, is now, and even the, you know, uh, those, uh, you know, supply, you know uh, supply chain managers uh, or supply chain companies like the, or food suppliers like the, you know, uh, Zomato, Swiggy, or, uh, you know, any of those uh, are the books delivered are goods delivered by Amazon, all of them are using uh, the location information and location-based uh, uh, services uh, with the help of this GNSS, Global Navigational Satellite System. These are satellites which, which not only provide, uh, uh, the, of course, GPS receivers working in, in our hands and in our smartphones, uh, they provide uh, services uh, which are called navigation and positioning services, navigation and positioning services. So we have one such regional uh, navigational satellite system in India. India has, it's called NAVI. And uh, this is how the uh, spacecrafts, seven of those spacecrafts view India and its surrounding and, and neighborhood of 1,500 kilometers on either side, on all sides of India. Now, the fourth technology, uh, that is being used in uh, geoinformatics is called Geographic Information System, GIS. It is a sort of, you know, uh, uh, data integration tool and spatial data analytics uh, tool. Uh, you have several information layers, geomorphology, soils, water resources, forestry, present land use and population density, etc. If you are trying to know at a particular place and if you are doing query, the queries could be how much area, what is the spatial distribution, faults in how many villages, which are those villages, how many watersheds, what percentage in each village uh, the mulberry gardens are, or sericulture farmers are, what percentage in each watershed a particular crop is being grown, like the sericulture, mulberry, or other food plants, and list of those villages, sericulture villages, and watershed wise information can be created. In other words, all these questions can be answered through querying and spatial data analytics 
that we operate through integration of these information resource, information layers of information. In fact, uh, Jack Langerman, the you know chief of the uh, ESRI uh, Environmental Systems Research Institute, calls GIS as a location science. GIS, in his language, is called location science. And using GIS, location-based services are uh, being uh, provided operationally. And today it has become a, a large source of billions of source uh, income and uh, revenue and the economy of a country is driven by these geospatial technologies. Now, if you look at a small, uh, quick look at the job chart of a, a sericulture extension officer, uh, we know there are several uh, hundreds of sericulture extension officers. Several of them have undergone training under my guidance also. Some of them are, uh, you know, scientists of, uh, you know, sericulture and, uh, and uh, remote sensing. For example, Dr. Ashok Reddy, who has been working at Karnataka State Remote Sensing Application Center, has been my student. Uh, who has been a sericulture extension officer, but subsequently became a scientist at SRSAC. A sericulture extension officer, functionary, needs information to ensure transfer of technology and implementation of several schemes. He has a responsibility to achieve the targets fixed under sericulture expansion, production of cocoons, besides assisting the you know, seniors and sericulturists and uh, the farmers who are practicing sericulture and their marketing. Also, supply crossbred DFLs, disease free layings obtained from government drainages to the sericulturists and monitor the disease and take corrective measures, collect technical data and maintain databases, give feedback on crops to higher officers making necessary field visits, collect soil samples and maintain necessary soil test records, identify the potential sites for sericulture expansion to new areas identify the beneficiaries under various credit subsidy schemes of the Central Silk Board or the Government of Karnataka's uh, Department of Sericulture programs and maintain grievance resistance and take follow-up actions in consultation with their higher-ups. This is quickly a brief job chart of extension, of extension functionaries uh, in the whole hierarchy of sericulture development is what I have shortly stated. Now, the need for geoinformatics in sericulture development. Why do we have to use a technology, an integrated technology and a, and a tool called geoinformatics in sericulture development? As you all know, the, you know, several states, even in Karnataka, the state Karnataka is witnessing, witnessing uprooting of mulberry in several places. We should know where it is happening and why is it happening? If some, in some talukhs, and if some talukhs are not able to achieve the targets of bringing additional area under sericulture and improve the production of silk, we should know which are those talukhs or poblis or mandals, and why are they lagging behind, we should also know and make an assessment. As you all know, there, are, there have been, it is my personal experience, that there have been, you know, a lot of erroneous estimates of actual area under mulberry and potential area for planning mulberry and development of sericulture in several agroclimatic zones of our country. Some lands are not suitable for sericulture and some are not suitable for cereal crop growing. And therefore, those lands which are not appropriate for cereal crop growing, we should find out where are they, how much is suitable for, for taking up sericulture and growing of food plants which habitats are suitable for not only mulberry, but other one silk like tassar, moga, and eri silk food plants in the forest ecosystems, because one silk comes largely from silkworms reared in forest ecosystems or forest species cultivation. We should know where those habitats are. Another question that haunts me is, do we have a good spatial database on where are our silk forms? How many are there in each district or in each hollow? How many grainages, where are they, rearing centers, chakki rearing centers, I mean, cocoon production units, and markets for better price and transactions of cocoon and raw silk, where are they? In other words, when I'm asking these questions, put before you these questions, one thing that comes out a common point among all these questions is where, what, at what location? 
is what is the question that we would be uh, needing to answer several of these issues which I have raised here. And that's where the geoinformatics technology provides uh, you know, appropriate solutions and help in problem solving and addressing the problems. That's where geoinformatics is needed. For example, today, this technology of satellite remote sensing, the spatial resolution of the sensors is so much advanced and so good that you can superimpose, you know, you can see a you know, superimposition is happening right now. The yellow lines, what you are seeing are survey numbers of farmers. Of a particular place, a small location I'm showing you. In the background, you have a satellite image with a very high spatial resolution where individual tree species and coconut garden within the coconut garden uh, individual tree species and other plantations could be seen. And you know, here you can see the spatial resolution of the sensors. Field bands, see the several field bands that you are able to see. Those fields which are fallow, those fields which have horticulture, those fields which have other crops, other tree species are all seen, you know, and you can make a judgment of if you have a knowledge of visual interpretation and, and image interpretation training, basic training of about two weeks, you will be able to map and find out where what exists is easily done today with the geospatial technologies and geoinformatics. Now, geoinformatics can be used in sericulture development in these areas. For example, to prepare GIS-based cadastral maps for mulberry gardens and their accurate area estimation is possible today. To generate database on soil fertility of mulberry gardens and prepare soil health cards and practice precision agriculture, precision sericulture, to create good geo-recorded database on assets created under several programs, you know, National Sericulture Project, NSP, World Bank Aided, and several new project, new programs funded by the both the Ministry of Textiles as well as the you know, other UN bodies. You can create and create a database of assets created so that there is no duplication. And there is a lot of transparency and accountability for the assets created and assets maintained, or whether the assets are you know, properly looked after or not can be you know, uh, taken care of in the sericulture sector, either by public or private sector, and by the entrepreneurs in the sericulture industry. Also, geoinformatics can be used to identify gaps in the sericulture infrastructure. Once you know this, you can know what needs to be done further and plan for further expansion of the sericulture infrastructure. Also, you can create agroclimatological database and advisory services on crop pests and diseases. Early warning of the crop pests and diseases is possible if you have proper geo, you know, agroclimatological spatial database created. You can also use geoinformatics to explore the feasibility of developing weather-based sericulture crop insurance schemes. You can also, which we have already developed, a silks sericulture information linkages and knowledge systems transfer silks about which I will describe in the subsequent slides. We have done it and we have we and we have been improving this silks and making the silks portal highly friend, user friendly for benefit of the sericulture extension functionaries and for the farmers of this country. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I feel that I have I have I have uh, briefly given you uh, the applications of geoinformatics in sericulture. It would be sufficient if I if I close this uh, presentation at this stage and uh, seek uh, uh, questions from you. But what I will do, uh, I will not leave at this stage. I will further continue to explain each one of these items which I have shortlisted here, how the geoinformatics is uh, useful in each of these items one by one. For example, accurate estimation of, which I mentioned here, accurate estimation of area under of uh, silk worm food plants. If you talk this as a subject, look at this. To do that, you need to know, first of all, the physical and physiological basis of identifying the food plants. Here I have given you an example of mulberry crop identification. Mulberry crop, for example, if you plot, these are the reflectance, you know, reflected gradients coming from the mulberry garden on this axis, expressed in, of course, digital numbers. And on this uh, um, axis, you put the uh, you know, various bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. You, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum consists of, the visible range consists of the VIPR, 
which you know violet indigo blue green yellow orange red etc and in the uh, beyond red you have infrared and shorter than uh, violet you have ultraviolet uh, ultrasound and x rays gamma rays beta rays alpha rays etc uh, so uh, this is what is plotted here is wavelength wavelength as you know uh, the distance between two peaks are two troughs of the electromagnetic wave so here we have put the uh, blue green red near infrared and short wave infrared or small electromagnetic spectrum is plotted here of a satellite called landsat pm this is a work i have done way back in 1988 itself 8789 uh, work i am presenting to you just to impress upon you that we started this project of applications of remote sensing long back almost three decades back so you, if you look at these uh, there are several uh, land cover types seen here plotted here but this green curve what i shown here is a typical signature of mulberry garden what it indicates is in the in the in the blue portion of the spectrum uh, there is some absorption in the uh, blue in the uh, green portion of the spectrum and in the red region of the spectrum electromagnetic spectrum there is there is a there is strong absorption in the red region whereas in the near infrared region there is a pretty high reflectance in the near infrared region of the spectrum from mulberry and such reflectance remains even in the short wave infrared and but there is a strong uh, absorption in the middle infrared and then of course the ir bands so mulberry garden has a unique spectral signature uh, distinct from others that's what i am trying to uh, convey here and uh, this if you take if you take the uh, reflectance in the red region here and you take the near infrared reflectance here in this portion of the spectrum red and near infrared you can always create what you call an ir by red ratio near infrared by red ratio uh, is is also called vegetation index uh, this was uh, you know a plot which i have uh, plotted in uh, by 1991 itself in the you know in the uh, indian silk uh, public uh, publication of my publication in indian silk you can look at here if this is a rabi season january to may uh, rabi and summer season months and these are the uh, near infrared by red ratios which i have plotted here long back uh, this in fact these these data come from 1980 publication of mine and dr angar and myself and dr rao you can see here paddy crop has got a unique signature indicated by red curve here you know spectral reflectance plotted as a, a function as a ratio of nir by red plotted over time plotted over time we call it as temporal spectral profiles of crops here there is a there this is a, you know rice crop uh, there is a, you know sugarcane crop uh, indicated by this uh, brown color and mulberry garden you see here mulberry garden this violet color pink violet color you know there, there is a green up pruning green up pruning green up pruning could be seen in the mulberry garden this is a very unique signature whereas this green uh, curve is uh, you know first karif uh, ragi crop which is harvested and rabi uh, you know rabi or summer ragi crop under irrigated condition is shown here in other words also the, the dry soil and wet soils are shown here in other words what i am trying to say spectral reflectance coming from plants or other associated land cover types are very different from each other this is normally what you expect from spectral reflectances uh, but there are instances where some crops uh, and at certain growth stages of their crops they spectrally mix up and they there would be there would be confusion that's where we use temporal profiles of spectral reflectance to identify the crops very uh, easily that's what the uh, technology we have developed over several decades almost two three and a half four decades of research from some of us has helped us in you know distinguishing uh, crops uh, from other crops from mulberry garden mulberry acreage estimation you know here you can see uh, there are, there is a mulberry garden and there is a ragi crop here but at this stage when they both of them are looking similar there can be spectral signature confusions but as the ragi crop matures and the mulberry garden continues to be green you know, this crop turns yellow undergoes senescence and, and uh, physiological aging and turns yellow whereas this crop remains green 
and that is the place we call it as crop window during which the identification of mulberry garden becomes much easier. Methodology is very simple. I know you can uh, always find this type of methodology in any of our publications which we have given. Uh, this is, you know, a very simple technique we adopt uh, based on understanding the signatures and uh, signatures and temporal profiles of the different crop types grown in a particular area. We also uh, apply uh, subject the remotely sensed data to computer aided digital classification. And uh, there are certain algorithms about which uh, sometime later we will discuss about how the algorithms are used for basically statistics. It is all you know, mean, standard deviation, and variance, covariance matrix around the mean is what is used for the purpose of you know, finding the distances between the uh, mean of uh, different crops. Uh, we call the uh, supervised maximum likelihood algorithm. Here you can see a classified output is shown here. This yellow color is mulberry. This uh, green uh, in the near the uh, valley is called uh, the uh, coconut gardens. And these red color, uh, you know, pockets filled fields are sugarcane fields. These are water bodies. And there are pulses and other crops shown in blue color. And there are some fallow crops, etc. All are I know this is a based on research at India's research at two least three sensor based, uh, you know, uh, classification output, which I have given you. Mulberry identification is easiest, easily done uh, with those multispectral image classification subjected to uh, digital analysis using certain algorithms. Uh, in fact, you can see mulberry classified output of mulberry. Now look at this example, like I brought it from Bellari district. Hagarabamanahalli uh, Taluka Bellari district. These are water bodies, and uh, this is Tungabhadra Dam, and some of the other uh, water bodies are shown here. Mulberry gardens are clearly shown in uh, green color here in this particular um, uh, slide. And these are those gardens which we have classified in uh, two villages uh, called Hosakere and then Hansikere uh, villages. And you can see those, uh, you know, Hoskere and Hanskere both are seen here. And in the command area of these uh, water bodies, you could see these mulberry gardens. Uh, all that green, what you are seeing are mulberry gardens. Very clearly, you can identify those mulberry gardens in uh, parts of Ballari uh, district. Uh, enlargement of, one more enlargement of those uh, Hoskere uh, are seen here, uh, so to highlight at all these uh, green color gardens or mulberry gardens. And uh, you can superimpose on this mulberry garden satellite image, on this satellite image, you can superimpose a cadastral map uh, of the uh, survey uh, during British time and survey numbers are available and Hanskere, uh, Hanskere, Hanskere village is uh, properly shown and the survey numbers are seen here. In particularly here, the survey numbers are very small, whereas these survey numbers are pretty big. And you can see the mulberry gardens behind, and those, you know, you can show those uh, mulberry gardens very clearly. Uh, survey number wise, you can show them. Here also, you see, same thing has been superimposed. Yellow lines are the yellow lines, what you are seeing are survey numbers, which I have shown you in the previous slide. And uh, the background is mulberry gardens. You can see them very clearly. In other words, mulberry gardens, survey number wise, you can identify and find out who the farmers are. That is the capability. For example, if I enlarge this particular uh, uh, image further, you can see those. You know, you can see this survey number and the garden inside. Survey number and, and there is no mulberry here. There is no not no mulberry here. There is no mulberry here, but there is mulberry here. There is mulberry here. There is no mulberry. No mulberry. Similarly, here you can see one more uh, very narrow uh, fields. Largely, the command area of this tank uh, has no, uh, no mulberry because maybe paddy crop is the dominant crop. But on the slightly, on the edge of this uh, valley, you find mulberry garden, slightly elevated location where the waterlogging problems are not an uh, issue. Whereas here, where water is a plenty, uh, they may be growing paddy crop, whereas mulberry gardens could be seen very clearly here. Now, that is what is existing. I have what I have shown you is an assessment of where what exists, how much mulberry garden exists, food plants exist, and what is the uh, likely 
uh, leaf uh, yield and how much of leaf yield can be converted into cocoons, how many DFLs can be reared, all that can be done with this information that what I have presented so far. Now, if you are expanding sericulture to new areas, which are those potentially suitable for uh, new areas, suitable for sericulture development? How do we identify them, such potentially suitable areas for sericulture development? We have done this exercise way back uh, as part of a um, project sponsored by the Central Silk Board to Indian Space Research Organization when I was at the headquarters of ISRO and also as head of the center of ISRO, regional center of ISRO, I have uh, got a project from, uh, uh, you know, right from when Mr. Balu Subramaniam, when Mr. Balu, Balu, famous Balu has been member secretary of the Central Silk Board and subsequently he retired as additional chief secretary to government of Karnataka. And uh, he must, he's still there and he's still continuing to uh, support the sericulture industry and sericulture development in his own capacity. So uh, during his time, we got a funding, initially a small amount of money, but subsequently we got huge funding support from Central Silk Board because Central Silk Board believes that the Indian Space Research Organization scientists are capable of developing the technologies for sericulture development and they have a lot of confidence in uh, you know scientists like you know some of us uh, i have i i'm i have been one of those uh, first of scientists to approach indian uh, central silk board and develop this technology for development of sericulture in our country as a whole so what we did uh, we did that exercise of identifying potential areas for sericulture development on 50000 scale uh, during the 10th and 11th plan period of uh, period plan period and then we have also done a sort of appraisal survey of finding out the actual area uh, of uh, sericulture, uh, sericulture before and after a project is implemented by central silk board we have also developed what is called sericulture information linkages and knowledge systems called silks for about 110 districts and now today it, it is much more I'll discuss much more about SILCH project uh, subsequently. Uh, in fact, those of you who would like to, uh, who would love to see uh, the portal of SILCH, you can go to this website, http colon double slash silks.csb.gov.in. If you go to this website, you will find a lot about uh, SILCH pro, uh, portal, uh, in which we have a lot of valuable information being added and updated every uh, month by my uh, by my center where i have served as director the center name is northeastern space application center now under that program um, almost uh, except uh, rajasthan haryana, uh, haryana and, and gujarat we covered most of the country under that project and several of these are the taluks and districts where we have completed this project and and this uh, and, and graph is little outdated uh, and uh, much more has been done than what is shown in these areas, in this map particularly. Uh, the methodology of finding out the uh, areas suitable for sericulture are, uh, is illustrated here. It's very simple methodology. Uh, not that, uh, you know, I have done it, I'm calling it as simple because, uh, you know, this is an Aster Dam. This is a digital elevation model, uh, which we have, uh, you know, developed using the data from a satellite sensor called Aster. Uh, today, we have in our country, uh, Carto Dam, a digital elevation model developed from Carto site by NRSC, National Remote Sensing Center of ISRO. From this uh, dam digital elevation model, you can derive slope map, slope information, and slope angle and slope direction can be found out. Azimuth angle of the slope can be always found out from here. If you have a soil map, the Karnataka State Remote Sensing Application Center has soil map on 50,000 scale. From this, you can derive soil texture, depth of the soil, drainage, you know, um, you know water availability and drainage uh, condition of the soil, and soil pH parameters can be inferred from the soil map, which the National Bureau of Soil Survey and Land Use Planning, in, in collaboration with the ASR SAC, has developed this uh, soil map, updated it to 50,000 scale. Even large-scale maps are av available at ASR SAC. Groundwater prospect maps have been prepared by ISRO's National Remote Sensing Center and, and also the Karnataka State Remote Sensing Application Center. You know, you must, you must be knowing that any project what ISRO does 
it does in collaboration with the state remote sensing application centers. Uh, that way, uh, the technology developed, developed by ISRO is uh, passed on to state government and, uh, and autonomous bodies and private companies, authorized and recognized private companies. They receive the technology from ISRO and they propagate it and use the technology. So groundwater prospect maps coming from the maps. And of course, you have India Meteorological Department or the KSNDMC, Karnataka State Natural Disasters Monitoring Center, providing information on rainfalls, temperature, and humidity. And uh, these three parameters, these two, mainly these two, temperature and humidity, uh, decide uh, this a place suitability of a place for silk warm rearing. Uh, together with rainfall and temperature, uh, and you can always uh, you know, do, uh, calculate the potential evapotranspiration, whether the PAT is able to meet the rainfall requirements uh, or whether the rainfall is, uh, no, sorry, the other way, whether the rainfall that is occurring over a place is able to meet at least 50% of the PET, based on that, you can always find out, I you know, length of growing period or crop growing period or climatological limitations for growing food plants can be assessed based on these uh, parameters plus the soil related parameters. So when you talk of the soil and the terrain information and groundwater prospect, you can always find out whether the landscape and soil limitations are allowing uh, would be allowing you to take up sericulture or not can be uh, gauged from these uh, three variables. In other words, these two, uh, this tells us the strength of the soil and type of top topography and terrain. This tells us the climate of the place. This tells us the suitability of a place for sericulture rearing. All these three put together and you apply a set of criteria on the, on the available land use and land use land cover information coming from other sources and take the cultivable land or culturable land and evaluate that culturable wasteland uh, from the point of view of sericulture needs, uh, climatological and soil needs and the agroclimatological needs of the silkworm rearing and apply this criteria, criteria-based analysis. We call it as MCA, multi-criteria analysis can be uh, tried in using GIS, geographic information systems, and you can come out with a, you know, a map indicating potential sites for silkworm food plants and sericulture development. So this is a, uh, these three are the outputs uh, from uh, several layers of uh, information that you generate from raw data you get from these sources, IMD, NRC, ASRSAC, and uh, you know, NRC again, or any other uh, open source dam available from on the internet. So this is the uh, uh, simplest methodology that we have developed and fully operational, uh, and we have been able to successfully uh, identify potential areas for sericulture development. The methodology is further illustrated here. From these resource maps, what you have, you know, from these resource maps that what I have listed here, you can always generate layers of information, polygons, polygons of information, uh, slope classes indicated by red lines, and, uh, you know, soil types and soil classes indicated by you know, these uh, black polygons uh, in terms of different soils, haplostalps, not good for, ostropeps are fairly good, ostropeps are uh, good, and oostic fluvians are very good for mulberry, et cetera, are identified. And then underground water potential, uh, you can always find, you know, these violet color polygons here are underground water potential, and cultural wastelands, which are in the background shown as green polygons, are shown here. Uh, in other words, this is how uh, layers of information uh, put in the form of points, lines, and polygons appear uh, in a uh, in the uh, when you derive uh, where you vectorize a, a raster data. When you are interpreting a satellite image, this is how you interpret and generate different layers of information. Here, a, an illustration is given on slope type, soil type, underground water prospects, and cultural wastelands are shown here. These layers of information you put through. Uh, a, a special data analytic tool called GIS, and you answer, you find, of course, there is, you need a participatory rural appraisal also to find out, you know, a sort of simple resource stock available uh, and productivity of each of that land, total number of people and the product, and the, you know, per capita demands of silk or silkworm development, or, all that can be done here. This is sort of socioeconomic demand analysis, demand supply analysis, which can be run and you can always find out, you know, whether the 
a given piece of land is supporting uh, food grain fiber, fi fodder fiber, and fuel wood. And of course, whether it is suitable for sericulture could be assessed through spatial data analytics using any software like ArcGIS or QuantumGIS uh, tool available with you. So when you integrate uh, these layers of information, when you integrate them, analyze spatially through the use of JS, you get an output something like this. The output here, what is shown here is, uh, in these white, uh, not colored areas, the land use is best utilized and nothing to alter them, nothing to uh, you know, change. But these were erstwhile wastelands, culturable wastelands, which appropriately can be used for these four pockets, what are shown here, in this five kilometers by five kilometer area of 2,500 hectares of land, only these small pockets, which are shown here, are good for sericulture. These are culturable wastelands and be brought under sericulture. There are uh, no agroforestry in these pockets. These numbers, which you are seeing, two and three, are good for apiculture and vegetable cultivation. Uh, these, these numbered as two are good for horticulture, good for horticulture. Uh, these number as four are very good for sugarcane cultivation. Sugarcane cultivation is possible here. There are others numbered as five. You see here, five. These pockets of uh, uh, land, uh, culturable wasteland, can be safely converted into pasture and fuel wood uh, cultivation. So that way, uh, you can appropriately identify a parcels of small parcels of each land, and based on the assessment that you have done through this integration. You can allot these lands, allocate and allot, allot and allocate parcels of land for these activities. And sericulture is one such methodology which we have done. And we can develop such uh, suitability criteria and uh, identify uh, areas suitable for sericulture as per watershed, for every watershed. And you can also show the, you know, for uh, sericulture development, water harvesting structures which are optimally located. All that can be done and where sericulture can be practiced in this particular watershed are shown here in the in, in this portion of the watershed here, this portion and this portion. But a large part of can be used for paddy and other purposes also as well. agro culture also shown here. So that way, uh, in fact, same methodology, the methodology what I have described here has been adopted uh, for uh, sericulture uh, suitability assessment for uh, several districts in Karnataka. Uh, one example of uh, suitable areas for mulberry cultivation for Bagalkot district, entire Bagalkot district has been evaluated uh, under my guidance and uh, at the Karnataka State Remote Sensing Application Center uh, with several uh, scientists participating and completed this project of sericulture, identification of suitable sites for sericulture development. Here, uh, these green colored pockets are highly suitable for sericulture yellow are moderately suitable for sericulture. These violet colored areas are marginally suitable for sericulture. These bright red colored pockets are never suitable and not suitable for uh, sericulture at all. So that way, uh, the whole district has been evaluated from the point of view of suitability. We have recommended uh, for the sericulture, you know, the, uh, the uh, deputy director of sericulture there or assistant director of sericulture only 8,815 hectares of uh, uh, entire uh, Bagalkot district is suitable for sericulture development. Well, remember, highly suitable ones are uh, recommended first. Uh, and such area is only, uh, you, you can see here, 8,815 hectares. Uh, even then, although we have shown this 8,800 hectares, we can further do a little more investigation at local level and narrow down the best suitable, not, highly, not only highly suitable, the best suitable also can be identified uh, can be identified for soil culture development. In fact, in the northeastern states of uh, India, uh, where uh, mulberry uh, basic sericulture is newly being introduced after bamboo flowering, uh, the statistics are provided here. They play, you know, actual highly suitable areas are recommended for immediate uh, conversion of the lands uh, into the sericulture, mulberry based sericulture. This has been done for other states also, several other states in the country. Um, and then uh, the uh, district-wise suitable area for mulberry cultivation in Karnataka, where we have done, I know, Bagalkot, Malgam, Bidar, and Chaturdurga, 
uh, we have given highly suitable, moderately suitable, generally suitable. Their acreage is also given here. And Bagalkot, as I said, 8,800 plus hectares is highly suitable for uh, sericulture development. And also, not only mulberry based sericulture, another important part of it is for Vanyasil, uh, we have the forest species, wood forest species, and which portions of the forest ecosystems are uh, you know, favorable for, uh, for example, Tassar food plants in Western Guards has been done for North Canada and Belgam districts of Karnataka. So you can always find out what species, what communities are dominant. For example, moist deciduous ecosystems are here. Once you identify that this is a moist deciduous forest, you can always identify what uh, predominant species are available within that ecosystem. Dry deciduous forests are shown by this brown color. And you know, moist deciduous are shown by this uh, uh, cyan color. And semi-evergreens and evergreens ecosystems are also shown here by red color, bright red color. And the semi-evergreens are shown here. What I'm trying to say, uh, don't be under the impression that these are forest uh, maps. These forest maps are very valuable inputs for uh, you know taking decisions on where, how much uh, one nestle can be developed. So that is where I'm trying to highlight even uh, satellite remote sensing helps in uh, developing vanya silk, not necessarily the mulberry-based sericulture alone. In fact, uh, we have, uh, you know, another important uh, work done by my student, uh, doctoral student, is uh, uh, Dr. Ashok Reddy. K. Ashok Reddy has done this uh, work under my guidance. Uh, that is on, uh, based on satellite remote sensing, how many, you know, what is the silkworm seed requirement? Uh, based on the leaf field, uh, a sort of biomass, mulberry biomass assessment has been done and leaf field prediction was done uh, month by month, uh, you know, uh, based on uh, satellite data collected on 3rd March 1997. Uh, on March, March month, what is the leaf field, number of DFLs required, and in the May, April month, what is the leaf field and number of DFLs required, what is the leaf field in the month of May, and what is the number of DFLs required, uh, has been generated. Similarly, using April 20th, 1997 data, we found out what is the leaf field in April month, again May month, and what is the June uh, leaf field and number of DFLs that can be rare have been, have been uh, you know, uh, uh, done and such information. Of course, this is a research and development program of, uh, you know, PSRSAC uh, with me helping, guiding them. It is now still in the developmental stage and R&D is still progressing. And we would one day be able to forecast, uh, you know, uh, number of DFLs that can be rare depending on the garden condition. Such a forecasting methodology uh, we are trying to develop and give advice to the farming community uh, across the state of Karnataka, elsewhere in the country also. We would ultimately reach at that stage of assessing the biomass and then uh, from which leaf field and the based on which number of DFLs that can be read can be predicted. Once you know the number of DFLs uh, read, you can always uh, produce cocoon production forecast can also be achieved. Of course, we need to uh, make some uh, uh, assumptions. For example, one acre um, of uh, uh, mulberry garden can support 250 uh, DFLs. And mulberry yield of 2,800 kilograms per hectare uh, is some assumptions. Cocoon production is also assumption from some 40 pages. Uh, cocoon can be produced for 100 DFLs. Some of these basic assumptions, these assumptions can be uh, wrong. We have to fine tune the model of cocoon production forecasting by changing these numbers appropriately. So that way, even we attempted, we, we took a bold step of making a cocoon production forecast based on the uh, DFLs required and leaf field available and area under uh, Mulberry Garden. That way, we attempted this uh, and we published this paper in, uh, uh, in an international seminar. And uh, in fact, we, have, we are further improving this technology. Now, I am trying to take you towards precision farming uh, in the, um, in the uh, sericulture sector. Uh, towards that, you need to have very good soil maps. That's number one. Of course, Karnataka State Remote Sensing Application Center has one such map that's not adequate. We need to improve it further. Uh, also, uh, such soil maps, as I have shown in the previous slide, 
Uh, you can download such soil maps from the silk spotter. And soil fertility mapping is something that the KSSRDI is doing. And we are updating and we are we want to make the a geospatial database of this fertility uh, studies done by KSSDI at Algatapura. And soil set of fertility and soil health uh, of, a, of a particular garden, uh, the data that you collect with GIS, GPS, and remote sensing based NDVA profiles would play a very important role in uh, practicing a precision sericulture or precision mulberry uh, uh, garden condition assessment and garden rearing and, uh, and uh, garden maintenance. Uh, but it requires, I know, huge database creation and a lot of effort is needed. And we are we have not yet, uh, you know, reached that target of uh, precision farming uh, uh, in, in mulberry gardens. Not yet. Uh, we need to develop and we need to move towards that uh, direction. You can correct me if any of the laboratories, maybe Central uh, CSRT Mysore, must be approaching this uh, problem in a scientific way, much better scientific way. Um, and we have to further look for uh, some literature on that and and see what else is happening in that direction. Uh, but towards that, uh, precision farming, uh, the uh, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, can also play a very important role because uh, their, their spatial resolution is of millimeters and centimeters. For example, if you look at a field like this, you can find out where the field is, you know, within the field, the spatial variability can be noted. And, uh, you know, you can see some of the variability in the same uh, fields in uh, such areas. So, Precision agriculture or precision farming is nothing but treating the uh, spatial variability across field is what it is. And uh, the UAV technologies, drones, for example, are being, here is a hexacopter assembled by Northeastern Space Operation Center. UAVs are now being used for the purpose of uh, claiming and settling the uh, insurance uh, claims made by farmers under Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bhima Yojana and uh, several other uh, applications of, uh, you know, even for making a correct judgment of the disease and uh, uh, insect attack uh, could be, um, you know, used for the purpose of uh, managing the gardens uh, using uh, UAV technologies. Another uh, major area of application of sericulture development, sericulture is um, finding out what is existing where in terms of a infrastructure that is being developed under several pro programs funded by the World Bank or other uh, Ministry of Textiles or other programs uh, coming from central government or from state governments. For example, here you can see the location of village tanks, village level tanks and their condition, you know, uh, it is a beautiful example. Even you can see uh, the survey numbers, the location, who is the owner of what, and uh, you know, all that, uh, it has spatial data as well as attribute data attached to uh, this is spatial data. So that way, uh, this is one simple example of, uh, you know, village tanks as an example I have given you. Uh, there are several assets, for example, arm farm technical service centers, some 140 of them in Karnataka, seed farms, uh, seed area technical service centers, seed cocoon markets, drainages, government cocoon markets, reeling units, non-farm uh, technical service centers, training centers and units, and SAR seed stations, some 400 such units are uh, there as part of the assets. But the question to be answered is, where are they? In what condition are they? How good are they? And how best they are managed? These are the issues that one can address if you can uh, you know, digitize, uh, create a spatial layer of, uh, inform of assets created under several programs of the governments. Other assets could be office building, cocoon market, check rearing center, government drainage, growth centers, mounting hall, and several of these, you know, all that, sericulture training schools, training center, cold storage, you know, women dormitory, production centers, mini silk chair, all these are called assets. And such assets are now being digitized and computer-based database, uh, spatial database is being created uh, under the finding support coming from Central Silk Board by ISRO's Northeastern Space Application Center. Uh, now, uh, the methodology of creating the uh, you know, assets is also simple. Uh, why I said simple is the GNSS, Global Navigational Satellite System, 
uh, which is commonly called GPS, is available on the smartphones of every one of you. Uh, and that is where this is uh, location information collected by using GPS, superimposed on a satellite image, and, uh, and a map created from that can be in a vector form, but always be stored in a uh, uh, no computer in a database. You can update it and upgrade it uh, every week or every monthly or every year. For example, you have here, for example, you see asset mapping in West Bengal using GNSS. Uh, here on the left-hand side, you see here, uh, you know, government schemes, marketing, etc. Uh, the varieties of crops uh, are the hybrid varieties being used for mulberry garden in the West Bengal, uh, in a place called Kampara uh, area, and you know, the, the mulberry gardens. You know, these colors indicate, for example, S1 variety is blue color, and this uh, S1635 is this, uh, you know, orange, brown, orange color, which means. In these areas, in such an area, uh, two, two broad varieties of mulberry is grown, and that is a record available for us in a special database. And of course, this is now being created in point mode, point, you know, in a vector database, you can store the, uh, you know, natural objects in, a, uh, in the real world in the form of points, lines, and polygons. There is nothing that cannot be represented by points, lines, and uh, polygons. In fact, I teach my students on the applications of JS and spatial database management and spatial data analytics. Uh, I have given it several times, I have given practicals to my students, asking them to represent the real world in the computerized database, in a JS database. They haven't found anything difficult to represent them either in the form of points, lines, or polygons. Whole world can be translated from the real world into a computerized world in the form of these three. Of course, you need to create a topology. Topology in terms of connectivity, decency, and containment, uh, and then uh, whether they're in up, north, down, south, east, et cetera, uh, can always be created in the geospatial database. It's a very highly professional and uh, a practical way of transforming the real world, the natural nature into computer, which is possible today with the uh, the special uh, JS tools, uh, which are commercially as well as open source JS packages available today. In fact, this I took it from this this morning. I took it from the Silk portal uh, run by Central Silk Board under the guidance of uh, ISRO's Northeastern Space Space Center. It is called Mulberry Information System (MIB). MIS they call it, and uh, this is one such beautiful example of assets. Um, a, a special database created by NASAC uh, of ISRO. And this is another good example of sericulture assets mapping and monitoring also, monitoring also under the Karnataka Geographic Information System uh, being run by the Karnataka State Remote Sensing Application Center. Again, uh, day before yesterday, I uh, got this slide, uh, downloaded and uh, print screened and put it into the slide form. You can see uh, you know, district name, aluk name, gram panchayat, uh, from the from date to date, you put these parameters in this and click on the search, you'll get within that period, how many assets have been created by the government or non-government organizations, where are they, in what state they are, and the number of them, and where are they, can be presented. The number, where are they? You know, in fact, around the Mysore district and Mandya, uh, where those uh, agriculture related infrastructure uh, assets are created uh, in a particular period. Uh, the period which I have, uh, I forgot here, uh, is shown here. You can put that and keep on updating it and monitor it, how much, where, who uh, can be found out. Also, the another application that I'm talking is agro plant logical database creation and giving advisories on uh, you know, pests and diseases which are important for sericulture. Uh, there are several sources of data. For example, meteorological stations available across India, automatic weather stations that, that are created uh, by the ISRO and the IMD, automatic weather stations. One such example is shown here. Several organizations like AS and MC, Karnataka State Natural Disasters Monitoring Com uh, Center, provides a lot of free data and of course, you have you know information on weekly information coming from S and MC, 
over and above, you have satellite-based weather monitoring possible today. For example, you see here on 14th 11, 2013, one example, a system developing in Bay of Bengal is moving in a west-northwesterly direction across Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, North Karnataka, etc., and on some parts of uh, Tamil Nadu, northern part of Tamil Nadu. You see here, next day, it is from Bay of Bengal, it is approaching coast. And uh, on 16th November, it has, you know, it has started giving heavy rains uh, in southern, southern uh, you know, Mysore, Mandya, some parts of uh, southern Karnataka, and large part of Tamil Nadu is receiving heavy rains because that was November. Uh, retreating monsoon is giving heavy rainfall here, as, the, as has happened this year, uh, in 2020. Heavy rainfall in the North, North Karnataka and across several parts of India. So, you know, what I'm trying to convey here is there are several sources of meteorological information coming freely, which can be properly, you know, uh, dovetailed into a, you know, advisory and forecasting system if one knows the agroclimate policy and the relationship with the uh, growth and uh, growth of mulberry garden as well as growth of silkworm. If the cycle of silkworm is properly understood, and you can relate these meteorological variables with the growth and growth of both mulberry as well as silkworm, and proper advisories can be given on what to do when, uh, depending on what uh, environmental conditions or climate conditions are prevailing, uh, or weather conditions are prevailing in the uh, area of interest. Uh, now I'll take you to another example uh, where uh, the sericulture farmers would need uh, underground water uh, and successful borehole uh, for uh, uh, you know uh, keeping the mulberry gardens uh, you know protected uh, during drought uh, drought like situation and drought conditions uh, agriculture droughts uh, where sometimes mulberry gardens also are uh, are uh, uh, get withered and they um, so, so, you know, dry up due to shortage of uh, water. So that is where underground water sources, groundwater sources, a satellite image like this, uh, if it is uh, given to a geomorphologist or a geologist, would translate that uh, geology and geomorphological information into hydrogeological information, uh, indicating, you know, where the runoff zones are, where the, you know, uh, for example, in this orange areas, you will ex expect 10 to 50 liters per minute of yield, whereas in these blue colored areas and green colored areas, you expect about uh, 200 to 400 LPM of water, underground water uh, resources are assessed. You can also prepare a water quality of the underground water, whether it is saline, whether it is pH is high, whether there is a whether it is potable or not potable, such information also can be generated. Such maps are available uh, from the KJS on water quality as well as groundwater prospects uh, maps are available. Uh, I have downloaded this from the own portal of ISRO, a groundwater prospect map, which can be easily downloaded and used for the purpose of uh, finding the potential of underground water. For example, uh, these red spots are the areas where you, you can never expect a uh, underground water. These are totally, uh, you know, no groundwater areas. But whereas these blue colored, green color, areas are the excellent sources of underground water and the borehole can be 100% or 98% successful in these areas. If, if, if a farmer drills borehole in these uh, green and cyan colored areas, borehole uh, success would be of, of the order of 90% and above. Whereas if one tries to put a borehole in these brown and uh, uh, you know these areas, there could be uh, failures. Whereas in these red colored areas, there will be a total failure of borehole. So that way, these groundwater prospect maps are very useful for uh, you know, uh, finding out um, sources for uh, groundwater, underground water during drought uh, conditions where you have saved the mulberry gardens from drying up. Uh, now I take you to the most important part of the uh, subject on uh, sericulture information linkages and knowledge system. This is a name I have given when Mr. Bhaskar, H.A. Bhaskar was the member secretary, and we both were trying to find out a name for the project, a joint project of ISRO between ISRO and Central Silk Board, he wanted me to suggest a name for the project. I gave this name uh, called SILKS. At the end of uh, all the sericulture practices that you do, ultimate product is silk. Here also, 
in the in the use of bioinformatics the ultimate product is a cell silks silk stands for sericulture information linkages and knowledge system in fact mr baskar said nageshwara you should get a patent for this name itself <laughs> though we did not apply for a patent as of now so the methodology of developing silk portal is very simple i am illustrating that methodology you take this state remote sensing application center natural resource information multiple layers of information on natural resources you can generate you can collect it from state remote sensing centers from other uh, you know sslr and others revenue department uh, village assistants etc you can get the cadastre survey number information can be connected these two are special information special data whereas from uh, organizations like ssrdi imd central silk board i know csr to mysore isro etc you can get several layers of non you know non spatial point information or other you know associated information can be generated uh, such bins of information can be integrated using as and uh, you can develop a sericulture decision support system there are of course a user hub to retrieve this data you can have uh, experts in sericulture analysts we thought of experts from ssrdi are from csrt mysore so this is a data collection job here synthesis of the job of the database creation of database and then you know data analysis on spatial data and then uh, you know uh, draw out or pull out the valuable tools for planning and decision making and disseminate them to farmers and extension personnel they you receive the feedback from them and improve upon the spatial database and enable the user interface accessible uh, through uh, a user hub this is what has been conceptualized as a, a silks portal and the silks portal looks like this and the silks portal i'll give you the portal uh, opening page the services that come from uh, uh, silks portal are divided into four areas one is the planning services uh, and the most important is natural resources information the first uh, services is in terms of potential areas for sericulture soil map underground water potential meteorological information etc all form part of the natural resource information the planning services include silkworm food plants and production technologies you know techniques for rearing silkworm the uh, what diseases and pest management measures are needed improved varieties of silkworm food plants processing of cocoons species of silkworm infrastructure and equipment and allied sectors are part part of planning services other services allied services like microcredit and self help groups seri marketing uh, facilities seed distribution centers weaving reeling centers schemes and grants for farmers benefit uh, you know credit and uh, you know subsidy facilities coming from different government organizations also uh, advisories for the farmers are weather and uh, and weather advisories this is pest forewarning and other support services are part of silks portal a portal of silks portal looks like this you can see this here uh, this is how the front page of the silks portal appears and you can need to log in and user name password etc some are freely available and uh, you what you get from silks portal are administrative boundaries polygons mulberry growing areas and polygons and the silk wise silk worm wise potential areas for sericulture development in terms of highly suitable moderately suitable marginal not suitable on 50000 scale of mapping and meteorological information monthly max minimum temperature relative humidity length of growing period etc are all available from silk spot now uh, the spatial the spatial layers uh, for example potential areas for sericulture development Uh, highly suitable moderately suitable in different colors are available the uh, other planning services on the left hand side of the silk portal you get all this you have to only click on this you get that information this is how the uh, you know infrastructure and equipment information uh, and the uh, silk portal front page looks like uh, this is one page another page and uh, of course uh, the potential areas for silk worm food plants more details are shown map wise location of the place village names some of those details are also present and uh, the advisories for example you see here when you click on the planning service for example pink pink mealy bug tokra leaf roller tips what is the treatment that you have to give and silkworm diseases like pessary what is the treatment that you have to give 
is all available. You can drop down this uh, menu and go through various uh, layers of information that you, you would like to have. Uh, diseases, for, for example, more details about tertiary symptoms, how they look like when they, when they are diseased and what measures to be taken are part of that. So in other words, the, the technology that was used for developing Silk's portal uh, is described here. There are various navigation tools for map navigation, such as controls such as zoom in, zoom out, zoom to full, full extent, selective zoom, recenter tool, fan, distance measuring, and print maps, etc., are available for the benefit of users. Those of you who want to use Silk's portal, be aware that this is all possible. Features on the map can be identified using the map identity tool. Distance measuring can be done using uh, the, uh, the icon available there. You can also do a little bit of spatial analysis. Results of map query or area of interest can be uh, displayed. You can take a printout of the uh, entire map you would love to have. Uh, the, the size, of font type, and map output can be customized using the tool that is available there. The map can be produced in various file formats like PNG, JPEG, GIF, and PDF formats. And you can also use region-specific Zoom is made possible using quick zoom tool available on the portal. Uh, okay, I hope you have been able to see that portal details. Uh, the opening page, if you go, uh, and if you enter through username and password, all that analytics are possible for you to do. Uh, to summarize, this is what I am summarizing ultimately. Uh, the summary part of all that I have spoken so far, uh, last about one and a half hour, I'm synthesizing and put it in the nutshell. Sericulture has tremendous scope for expansion of particularly non-traditional sericulture states and non-traditional districts in traditional sericulture states. There's still scope for development. And resource Northeastern Space of Place and National Project, bioinformatics tools have been used in sericulture development. It covers 178 districts, 108 in phase one and 70 in phase two, covering 25 states of the country and 61 districts in northeastern region of our country. The web portal called Sericulture Information Linkages and Knowledge Systems, for short called SILS, has been developed using open source GIS as a single window access to uh, all that information related to sericulture development. It's a single window access to provide both spatial and non-spatial information for selected districts in our country and hosted in the public domain. The domain is available here. Those of you who wants to take a print screen of this and have this a summary uh, will be useful for you. Uh, this is the place where you can access this, my Silks portal. The Silks portal has uh, more than 1,000 sets of spatial layers, nearly 1,000 spatial layers, and 16 non-spatial modules on sericulture planning, farmers' advisory, and other services specific to each district. And this Silks portal is available in 12 major languages of India. Assamese, Bengali, Telugu, Kannada, all are uh, available, as I am told by my uh, colleagues from Northeastern Space of Care Center. That's all what I wanted to speak to you. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. And I am and I am before you in case you have any other doubts and clarifications needed. Thank you all very much for listening to me very patiently. Now, uh, the part of, uh, I request all the participants, if you have any queries, uh, clarifications because we have a, a splendid lecture from uh, Dr. Uh, P. P. N. Rao. So he has, sir has covered from soil to silk almost all the aspects. Sir has not left uh, any of the aspect. In sericulture, we usually tell the students we have to learn from the soil. If soil is good, then only silk is good. So if you want, you should not blame on the farmer. You have to blame on the soil always. So if the soil is good, then only say usually was the persons are blaming on the shopkeeper sometimes. Silk quality is not good. Don't blame the shopkeepers. Shopkeepers are simply displaying the material, that's all. So therefore, sir has given a detailed information. There is no information that is left, I think, as of my knowledge. It is very, very, very splendid lecture and very good lecture, when the, very informative, I can say. So actually, there are about 125 students totally. Uh, participants, they have... Uh, uh, login for this one, but uh, we have only maybe 75 or so now. The number doesn't matter always. 
number doesn't matter because we cannot force anybody to uh, log in something like that. Those who are interested, now I request each one of you to please ask our classification, clarification, any clarification for that matter in respect of this topic, please. I think uh, P. Sangeeta has raised her hand. Sangeeta, if Sangeeta is on the line, you please go ahead about the question. Yeah. Sir is on the line. Sangeeta? Okay, no problem. Any participants can ask questions. Any participants? You have to ask the... Always you have to raise the questions so that maybe the answer... May, this Because Sir is giving a very good uh, informative information. So therefore... I request all the participants to please ask the question, please. Or you can raise a hand. Yes, please. You introduce yourself and ask the question, please. Introduce yourself and yes. ask the question directly to sir, please. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Someone. Tell me. Someone. Wait, wait, sir. wait, please. Sir. Sir, please uh, uh, tell your uh, name and ask the question, sir. Galaxy tab. Galaxy tab. Please. I think name is not there. Galaxy tab A. That is the thing that is there. You please introduce yourself and ask the question directly to sir. Please. Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon. Please. Sir, please. Carry on. Dr. Venkatesh Kumar, Central University of Lucknow, sir. Uh -huh. Yes, please. Please go ahead. It's very informative uh, in uh, lecture. Uh -huh. There is no doubt at all you have covered uh, almost all. It is like a, you have given complete package. Okay. It is complete package yes, yes. of very technology to, to improve the sericulture. And uh, definitely whatever work you have done, it, it in, in a nutshell, I think it, it gives uh, wonderful uh, information not only for any individual, it is industry. It is for entire industry, and uh, I don't know how far uh, all your uh, work, all all your technology have been utilized by the government. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, may can I answer now? Yes. The, please, uh, please. the yes, central please, silk board, central silk board, government of India, Ministry of Textiles is the uh, sponsoring authority for the several of the projects which we, we have started from 1988 onwards. And uh, the, the SSB uh, keep on monitoring and uh, improving the feedback from the uh, several user uh, departments of the state governments and several non-government organizations also. They keep giving that feedback to us. And that feedback is coming after the utilization of the special databases that we have created and disseminated through the silks portal so that way silks portal the portal what we have developed and launched on the internet and available freely for any one of you has enabled usage of data much more easy and much more popular now but you know way back in 1988 when i did this uh, pilot projects we were not able to web enable the data at that time, there were some limitations of handing over the maps, giving the maps in physical maps and giving them to the uh, sericulture extension officers. There was a constraint those days. But today, this uh, computerized and internet-enabled databases are being used profusely, and we receive feedback on the use of it. And if, you know, the fact that the fact that the state governments of sericulture departments and non-government sericulture practitioners are repeatedly coming back. Uh, to us, to ISRO, and to ISRO portal is being accessed by several uh, thousands of people. Itself is an indication that these databases are being used uh, uh, profusely by them. This is this is a proof for us. Okay, next, please. sir, Professor Aran Baskar, sir, please ask question. Please, please go ahead, sir. Oh, happy morning, uh, Professor Chanapa. Thank uh, you, thank you. Please, please. Sir, please. Uh, Rao is uh, given uh, yes. very uh, technical uh, information. Yes, yes. The agriculture industry, as uh, uh, Kumar said, from uh, all corners of sericulture, sir has given the information. Yes, yes. Actually, all uh, the young scientists who are in the verge of uh, knowing sericulture, 
has benefited much from the presentation. Sir, the one thing I want to clarify from your end. Sir, the very recently, government of Karnataka has taken bivoltine uh, crossbreeds, FC1 and FC2, for popularizing in northern, Karnata, northern parts of Karnataka than a southern state, I believe. So what may be the strong reason, sir? Whether uh, the yes. weather parameters are different in the northern Karnataka compared to southern India. But as per the statistics, as we are uh, knowing from the corners of the subject, the state government is moving FC1 and FC2 to the northern Karnataka. What may be the strong reason, sir? Uh, number one, Yes, sir. Uh, there is a there is a uh, long period of non rainy non rainy days. Okay, you know, sir. Non non rainy days are going to be much more in northern part of Karnataka compared to southern part of Karnataka because we okay. received two monsoons. Yes, sir. Uh, southwest and northeast. Northeast. That could be one strong reason. I personally believe in that. Yes. Second is second reason could be that we have pretty uh, good number of cold days in North Karnataka. There is a pretty long duration of cold days. You know, okay. winter, winter, winter months are much more extended period is available. And silkworm and cocoon formation and the silkworm, uh, cocoon, uh, what, spinning the cocoon spinning. is much more uh, efficient under uh, cold conditions. You know, dry but cold conditions, not wet and cold conditions. Dry and Dry and winter months. So yeah. These two agroclimatic reasons could be the reason for number one. Second is the North Karnataka being, uh, you know, black soils, what is all, having that? got uh, better uh, water holding capacity and residual moisture is much, much better. And therefore, the duration over which the mulberry, got, mulberry cultivation would be much better uh, during, uh, you know, non rainy period also. Without, without exposure to disease and pests. So these three, one is plant related, another is agroclimatology related reasons, could have been the reason for uh, promoting uh, and diversifying the agriculture in northern Karnataka and taking the uh, sericulture to uh, non-traditional districts within the state of Karnataka. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Am yeah. I right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Please. Please. Uh, next one? Any participant ask wish to ask? Any participants wish to ask questions? Please. Please go ahead. Likhe. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes. Chachandra Shekhar, please go ahead. Please. Yes, please. Sir, I have a query on this. Uh, ah, so, yes. we use uh, artificial intelligence for any of the things, so image processing and all those things. Hmm. So, in this case, is it possible to recognize the uh, category of different uh, genotypes in the different, different uh, area, whatever the cultivation is going on? Hmm. And is it possible to uh, identify the uh, farmers uh, who are rearing the different genotypes of uh, silk mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one thing, you are referring to uh, genotypes of the silk worm itself. Yes, sir. Uh, but I was uh, reading it as genotypes of mulberry gardens or genotypes right. of varieties of mulberry or varieties of food plants is what I am trying to understand it. I, but I, we, I, you I, added I, a I, sentence, I, you added a last word, genotypes of the silk worm. Uh, maybe uh, we are, uh, you know, space technology people, we do remote sensing. Okay. Uh, whether uh, remote sensing, if I consider uh, electron microscope or, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, powerful compound microscopes also as devices of remote sensing, you know, uh, maybe you can find out the genotypes. You know, when you are genotyping, you have to understand the structure of the DNA and the other the sequence or the genes are located. In fact, there also arrangement of the spatial arrangement of the genes on the chromosome play a very important role, as uh, you know, Barbara McIntosh, McIntosh has found out long back. Jumping genes, etc., they play a very important role. So, 
so to that extent we are not uh, efficient and we are not experts in that field of specialization you know jumping genes play a very, very tremendous yeah. role in evolution of the that's, that's uh, yeah. you know uh, so we are not we are not in that field oh, okay sir. okay sir. thank you okay any questions any questions from the any participants no uh, sir, dr sanapa yes sir please please go ahead sir manjana sir please uh, i am uh, professor manjunath sir hmm. uh, dr nageshwar sir my hearty compliments to you for having uh, provided a uh, lot of information on this aspect uh, touching upon uh, the aspects from soil to silk yes sir uh, hope I, it's audible to you yeah. yes, yes yes sir yes Yes, uh, yes. So we have yes, shared upon us lot of information, and uh, we feel uh, that we are immensely benefited uh, by your talk. But uh, the information provided uh, by from your end is voluminous, so voluminous that this would have been safely divided into four webinars like this, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. because uh, uh, we are not well versed in this area. and uh, we find that uh, this is uh, uh, going little above our head uh, therefore uh, a smaller aspect uh, because this would have been safely divided into the four aspects maybe mulberry side soil side silkworm side and extension side uh, separately okay. yeah. and uh, uh, each one of it would have been touched upon uh, because uh, it has already taken uh, clearly almost 2 hours now uh otherwise i have no comments about uh, your expertise and uh, the amount of information provided uh, by you and uh, the everything is simply excellent uh, and uh, i worked for uh, more than 3 and 1/2 decades in the field of sericulture now i am retired mm -hmm. i am one year younger to you i am my birth <laughs> party is 1954 <laughs> uh, so you are my elder brother uh, you are like my elder brother and uh, i am happy that uh, you have been involved in uh, sericulture related uh, projects uh, since 1988 when yeah. dr balu was at the helm of affairs yeah and uh, i was there uh, at that point of time i was assistant director in some one of the extension centers of central silk board i came in 1999 i i joined in 80 and 99 i shifted over to university of mysore as associate professor and retired in 2016 sir nice to know that and uh, now the information provided by you uh, is really useful at such a time when there is a severe dearth of uh, uh, ground level or uh, grassroots level workers mm. uh, through remote sensing and whatever uh, the applications that you have developed would be of great use uh, to gather information without visiting these spots because now we don't have people i know today we were seeing uh, and uh, sending people we ourselves used to visit in early 80s or late 80s early 90s so there were quite a few people visiting uh, and gathering information and all that but now it is quite appropriate that uh, this your lecture would be of great use uh, much more more than what it was before and uh, now uh, with uh, Uh, very skeletal staff being available uh, what uh, but there cannot be any doubt whatsoever that we can gather uh, um, information in a very precise manner and uh, take appropriate uh, corrective measure whatever it may be uh, so like that uh, really it's a very very useful uh, lecture sir from your side uh, i am i for one i am immensely pleased and uh, hope my uh, co participants would uh, uh, endorse my view Uh, what i will do what i will do sir bandana sir yeah, what please. i will do after this covid 19 uh, trouble period is over ah. come to uh, mysore university stay yes, in the yes. guest house ah, and ah. deliver uh, one lecture one day yeah 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 those uh, six items what i have discussed ah, and okay. uh, i'll stay for about four days in your oh. campus <laughs> okay, mysore okay. university campus pro provided oh. professor sanapa yeah. Yes, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. Hospital. So that, uh, no, there will be a, there will we'll be a there, so that there would be a there will be a discussion uh, yes, yes. Uh, on uh, the each uh, each of the aspects. Yeah. So definitely will uh, provide a platform. Uh, yes, sir. Please. Our next barrier now. Yes, sir. What? Definitely will provide a platform after this COVID nineteen, sir. 
Sure. There is no doubt in it. No right, problem. Right, right. No, no yeah. issues. No problem. Yes. Please. So, thank you questions? so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, Professor Nageshwar Rao. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions from participants? Yeah. If there are no questions, sir, uh, let us conclude by thanking. Uh, I thank immensely Dr. Uh, P. P. N. Rao for having delivered a splendid lecture. As uh, the co-participants have to already clearly told, this is a very voluminous uh, lecture. It can be divided into many uh, lectures. That is not a problem now. So having uh, delivered the lecture on behalf of the Department of Sericulture, University of My Mysore, I immensely thank Dr. P. P. N. Rao for having delivered the lecture. Thank you very much, sir. I thank all the faculties, research scholars, students, my fellow colleagues, and each one of you, those who attended the uh, this webinar. Thank you one and all for attending it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Namaskar, sir. Namaste. 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 Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you, sir. Please.